station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? And Houston Station, I'm ready for the event. European Space Agency, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call the ISS for a voice check. Station, this is David Honus at ESA. How do you hear me? Hello, David. I hear you loud and clear. How me? Yep, yep fine. fine. So, so thanks, thanks uh, for, for, for today, today Matthias. Uh, you, are you are now connected, connected with Ezra Germany, Ezra Ireland, Ireland and Ezra Czech, Czech Republic. Republic. And before, before we begin, I uh, just thought I'd pass the floor to you for some opening, opening remarks. Well, I'm very happy that the students are interested in joining me today, learning about life in space, because I think the future of humanity is exploring space, exploring farther beyond Moon, Mars. And uh, on ISS, we are learning all this for the last 20 years. We've been finding out, discovering how the human body lives and reacts in space, how we can do science in space. And so I'm really happy to see that the students are interested now in asking their questions. Great, great. great. Okay, okay, so, so we, will we will begin, begin with uh, questions, questions from Germany. Germany. Um, as we're Germany, Germany please, please proceed, proceed with your, your first two questions. questions. Since we know that uh, Russian is the galactic language, or one of the languages, the ISS, I like to say, Minya Zavut Abraham van Veen, Privet at LSI, Matthias Kakdila. No, все все хорошо, если меня зовут Матиас и привет тоже. Yes, Maura. My name is Noah and I'm 16 years old. I'm from Germany, the G Kiel Waldorf School. And my question is, which of the experiments that you will be, will be involved in during your time on the ISS interests or excites you the most? That's a very, very nice question. You know that I studied material science engineering and material science is the basis or the foundation of innovation that we need on our, in, in our countries, in our Western societies, because our societies are based on technology. And so um, material science experiments, we also perform a lot here on the International Space Station. For example, we have several furnaces where we can smelt metals, study them, and like learn a lot of stuff that we cannot learn on the ground. But one of my really favorite uh, experiments now, it's also related to material science, but it's a material that you all know and which has been in use for hundreds of years already. It's concrete. Concrete, which you use to build a house. And... Um, you will be surprised to learn that we test now concrete in space. It's not because we are planning to build a house with concrete in space, but it's uh, concrete making produces a lot of CO2 and CO2 has a lot of importance for climate change. And so improving this process um, has a lot of impact for society. And so um, I will be performing several mixtures of concrete here in space. We will study the material then on the ground and learn how the hardening process works. And um, we hope that we can learn a lot and to improve this process on the ground to also maybe to reduce the CO2 production during concrete making uh, on the ground. Good afternoon. I am Sebastian Schmidt, STEM teacher, Schiller Schule Bochum. Our question. Are machine learning and artificial intelligence already used in experiments on the ISS? What do you imagine the uses of AI and space exploration could be in the future? Yes, indeed, artificial intelligence and machine learning are key. Uh, they are new technologies, very powerful technologies. And um, I have, for example, two of these technologies in my experiment sets. Um, one is like a study for analysis of the eye. So using an iPad, a standard iPad with a small lens in front of it, um, students were able to program a machine learning process looking me into the eye 
and they can analyze then the changes of my eyes during space flight. And um, like the changes of the eye is currently one of the major medical concerns for extended periods of time traveling in space. The other one is a small intelligent uh, device which is called Simon. It will be activated la later during my mission. And Simon has artificial intelligence. It is uh, ground interaction still, so the uh, computing power is on the ground. But in the future, we hope that the computing power will be on board of the spacecraft. And then we can fly, for example, to Moon and to Mars. And we always have expert knowledge with us. For example, when in the future an astronaut will be walking on the surface of the Moon and will have a question saying, like, is this rock the correct one that I shall bring back to Earth or is that uh, rock the correct one? Then hopefully this machine learning or this artificial intelligence device can recommend to the astronaut and has all the expert knowledge on site available. That's especially important once we are out of contact with our flight control teams on the ground. For example, when we go down into deep caves uh, on the moon or later on on Mars, it's really essential because of the time lag between Earth and, and, um, and Mars. So if I ask on Mars a question to Earth, it might take up to 20 minutes until my question arrives on the ground and then 20 more minutes until the answer comes back to me. So that's really where we need artificial intelligence to support us. Thank you, Matthias. Okay, so now we're going to switch over to Ireland. Ezra Ireland, please go ahead with your first two questions. Hi, I'm Rebecca Young from St. Leo's College, Carlo, and I'd like to ask, what idea would you like to see space researchers explore to create a better future for Earth and for future exploration? So, like for space exploration and continuous continued travel into space, we need to make sure that all the stuff that we need to have, that we bring it along, uh, but without making too much garbage and waste. For example, all the air that we breathe and the water that we drink and all the food that we need and also the clothing. So um, all that stuff has requires a lot of room, like for space flight, for traveling, but in the end it also needs to be disposed of, so it's waste. And um, what will be really helpful for space exploration and the same for ground is looking further into closed life cycles of products. From cradle to grave, it's, uh, it's how we call it. So looking at how much energy you need uh, to produce an object and how long you can use this object and then later on also to look into the details in how to dispose or recycle or reuse a certain product. And for us in space that would be essential because imagine you want to travel to Mars, it's a trip from at least 500 days. If you bring everything along with a lot of garbage, a lot of packaging, then uh, your spa spacecraft needs to be uh, double as powerful and double as big in volume. Afternoon, sir. I'm Harry Feeney from Presentation College, Carlo, and I would like to ask you, can you describe what it was like and how you felt the moment you saw Earth for the first time from the cupola on the ISS? That's indeed a very emotional question. And, um, you know, when I arrived here on the station, it's we had 15 minutes to go before we had our PAO event. And so I said, like, oh, can I have please a look um, into Cupola? And um, my colleague said, yes, yes, go ahead. You still have a few minutes. And so I floated into Cupola. And I opened and I opened the shutters. And then I looked outside down on planet Earth and I saw planet Earth fully blue with the clouds above and that looked for me like almost similar to what I what you know like when you up, look up into the uh, into the sky you see a blue sky and the clouds but then next to our planet the round planet and you can clearly see that our planet is is a ball a sphere and next to it you see completely black black night sky and so it's like what really fascinated me that I could see day and night in one and it was such a striking emotion to be floating above Earth and seeing all this beauty below me. It's a, it's a moment that I will remember, I believe, for the rest of my life. Thank you, Matthias. Okay, so now we're going to switch over to Czech Republic. 
Ezra, Czech Republic, uh, please proceed with your first two questions. We don't hear you. OK, go ahead. So hello, uh, I'm Marco Spichel. I'm 19, 19 years old and I study on Litomiritska High School. And my question is, uh, how is the outside surface of the ISS affected by the <laughs> by the Earth's uh, upper atmosphere. Can you repeat this question, please? Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, I will repeat it. Uh, yeah. oh, oh. OK. So I the question is, I understood it. Sorry, how I is the, the outside surface uh, of the ISS? OK. Yeah, sorry, there's a time delay in the transmission from the ground to, to up us here. So it's we have a residual um, atmosphere, I would say, like, uh, some um, oxygen atoms that still are outside presence. So it's very, li very little because if there was uh, quite a bit, then the, uh, the drag would slow down the ISS and we would always uh, lower our orbit and then sink fully into the atmosphere and then we would uh, yeah, burn up. So, uh, but in a height of 400 kilometers, that's where we are flying currently, it's uh, just a little bit of oxidation process, I would say probably on the outside of the ISS due to this residual atmosphere. The main concern for us is not what is from the atmosphere coming towards the ISS. It's more like what's coming from outer space to us or like what is coming down, what uh, man has sent up, like old rocket stages or defunct um, satellites that can then pose a problem once they are on collision course with us. And that happens occasionally. And in these cases, we, um, we are informed from the ground and the ground takes action. And then we raise the orbit of the ISS, which we always have to do um, several times a year. And so we avoid then, then the space debris. Thank you. Andrzej Svátek, I'm 16 years old and I am from Laborki CZ. Uh, how does uh, microgravity, microgravity affect the liquid in your body? Uh, did you observe any changes when you arrived in space? Thank you. Yes, uh, I actually realized two or three nice changes, or like I would say, like one nice change. It's like my belly becomes flatter because everything moves up. But uh, there's more liquid now in my head, and you see, like, my face is rounder, probably, and a little bit more puffy. My legs are thinner. Uh, in English, we say, like, I have chicken legs and a puffy face. That's typical for astronauts. What I also realize is I have a little bit more pressure on the inside of my eyes. So, um, and in the first days, I also had a little bit more pressure in, in my head, and I felt, like, kind of, like, congested. Um, also, uh, a slight headache. So the body needs to adapt to microgravity and to this fluid change. And uh, I believe that happened in the first seven days. Maybe it's still ongoing. Um, definitely I feel already better, but I can still feel in my eyes that there is a higher pressure of liquid in my eyes. And uh, also I saw like one or two of my colleagues had a little bit more reddish eyes in the first days. So I believe that's all a, a consequence of the fluid shift. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, sorry about the comms issues there. Um, so now we're going to switch back to Ezra, Germany uh, for one question. Hello, my name is Nikita Schiff and I'm 15 years old. I'm a student at Goethe Schule in Bochum. And our question for you is, experiments on the growth of crops and plants are conducted on the ISS. So far, which plants have successfully been grown in space to obtain food from them? Are there also ideas for research about how to build a closed ecosystem in space to be able to produce food? Yes, that's a very nice question. Uh, actually, um, if I could turn the camera, it's like right on that side here, we have a small um, like rack where we can grow plants. And so several plants have already been grown here on the station when we arrived. Um, our colleagues from Crew 2, who left only two or three days before, they left us some green peppers, which they had cultivated here on the space station. But um, 
I believe also tomatoes have been grown here and different uh, types of, uh, of, of lettuce leaves. Um, I think the most potential probably would be algae, um, like grown in space, because that is a process that integrates well with life support system and also with what we astronauts need as kind of nutrition values of vitamins as well. Um, you also asked for research on the ground. Um, in Germany, there is the CROPS project looking into that one. It's a project run by DLR. And ESA has been running for several years a research program which is called MELISA. And that uh, is ma uh, mainly run, I believe, in Spain, but also in other European countries. And that's looking into closed loop systems. How can you use, for example, the P of astronauts uh, to recycle it, to make clean water, but then again use what you take out of um, the, the water to fertilize the ground and uh, how to use then also waste to make it again into soil and to grow plants. So it's a very, very interesting topic and I think we need um, research success in this area before we can actually fly to Mars and bring people to Mars. Okay, thanks Matthias. Um, I've just been informed that we have time for one more question. Um, so we're going to now switch back to Ireland. Um, Ireland, please proceed with the final question. Hi, um, I'm Alan Cleaver from Tyndall College, Carlo, and I would like to ask, can you share some of, some of your highlights of your astronaut training and what is the most rewarding part of being an astronaut? Well, the astronaut training by itself has been a huge, huge highlight because you do so many stuff that uh, I always dreamt about, like what I would like to do. You have survival training, you learn special skills. That's all required in case that our spacecraft, when coming back from space, lands in an area which is not foreseen, like an emergency landing. And then we need to be able to survive for two or three days until the, the research teams come and find us. But the most uh, like space-like training is the training underwater. Um, in Cologne, in the European Astronaut Center, as well as in Russia, um, in the Astronaut Center and in Houston, we have huge pools that are like 10, 12 meters deep. And in these pools, we have the modules, the ISS modules, like a, a copy of them, um, in original size. And then we can dive underwater for several hours and we train how we would work in space. It's more an activity to practice the work that we do outside in a spacesuit. The work that we do inside um, in the modules is uh, not tested in microgravity or also not underwater. It's more done like in a lab environment. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Matthias, for your uh, for your time and your answers today. Um, just quickly, I'd like to give you a, a, an opportunity to say goodbye to all the all the sites. Well, many thanks to all the students who participated, the students in Ireland, in Czechia, in the, my home country, Germany. I really, really appreciate that you guys are interested in science and what we are doing here in space. Please follow us. Um, we are doing outstanding science. Um, I myself have between 100 and 150 different experiments. Um, in total, our crew will run around 300 to 350 experiments in the six months that we are up here in space. And you will see a lot of this later on in your daily life um, as, as products that were coming from space and ended up as being for the benefit for people on the ground, but also for the benefit of future space flight, because we want to go further into the universe. We want to fly to the moon and we want to fly to Mars because we have big, big questions, questions like how did the universe begin? How does it work? How did life come to Earth? And is there life somewhere else in the universe? Thank you very much. Stay tuned. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event. Thank you to all the participants from the European Space Agency Station. We are now resuming operational audio communications. <laughs>